In case you missed it, here's a sports animal rewind. Very pleased to be joined by the head football coach of the Tennessee Vols, Butch Jones. Butch, how are you? Good afternoon. Hope uh, everyone's having a great day. Well, we're doing great, and we appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, I heard you say the other day that probably the greatest night you've had as Tennessee's head coach was Friday night at the Letterman's gathering at uh, at Neyland Stadium, where I think you said there were at least 500 former Letterman and or their spouses there. Uh, just talk about that uh, that evening. Well, uh, obviously it was a great evening, and you know what? The day on Friday actually got started off, like I've been telling everyone, with the 7.45 a.m. knock of the door by Arian Foster. And, you know, first time he's been back. And so they have the opportunity to basically spend the entire day with him. And then it's all about our former players. You know, it, they're the ones that are responsible for this great tradition, the excitement that surrounds our program. And for 500 of them to come back, it was a great evening. You know, I stayed from the beginning to the end. I wanted to try to say hello to each and every person there. Probably didn't make it uh, to all 500, but I tell you what, just hearing stories, but hearing the pride and the passion that comes along with being a ball for life uh, was very rewarding, to say the least. After going through spring practice, are there some freshmen that you feel like have to be able to come in and contribute this fall? Absolutely, and unfortunately, you never want to, uh, you know, rely on, 17, 18 year old freshman coming in, but you know, that's kind of where we're at. And, uh, you know, so, and that's one of the things that we sold in recruiting, but, you know, I think it's been well documented. We're going to need some freshmen to play at the receiver position. It is what it is. And so, uh, you know, as soon as we can uh, get them in here in June, obviously it's going to be critical. But I would say, uh, you know, some depth in the offensive line, which obviously is extremely challenging as well because, uh, you know, each individual develops differently on their own. But obviously the size and, and the strength that comes along with that position, uh, the corner position, you know, we're excited about the two corners coming in. So they're going to have a great opportunity to compete. So really, you know, every freshman coming in, all 21 signees are going to have an opportunity to compete and compete early. In regard to the completion percentages, and I know it's not all on the quarterback, but I, I'm sure they weren't at the level you want them to be. How can you get the passing game improved, and, and how much can it improve during an off season with the quarterbacks getting together with wide receivers? Well, Jimmy, trust me, I've spent uh, an inordinate amount of time uh, on our throw game, and uh, you know we've always thrown the ball effectively and efficiently. And you know when I look back, first of all, some of it was we didn't throw a lot of stuff. You know, the other thing that I think in the spring game is is they know your calls. Uh, sometimes the corners are as good as anyone in knowing your signals. But, uh, you know, I think the big thing is, is you know, everyone looks at the completion percentage. But, you know, we didn't help our quarterbacks out on the perimeter. We weren't able to defeat man-to-man coverage. We weren't able to separate. And uh, so, you know, all the corners were sitting on our routes. And I thought... Justin really had one throw where really I wish we could get it back and rethrow it again, and that was the the deep ball down the sideline uh, to Devon Young, and uh, so you know I thought that was the one that you know for us to win and win consistently he needs to make that throw. But you know I thought overall I thought our quarterbacks had a productive spring, and summer's big. You know that's where you really develop your trust, your rhythm, and your timing. Hi, Coach Jones. It's Vince Ferrar. Good to talk to you again. Coach, are there position switches that that you're at least thinking about potentially for the fall right now? You know, Vince, right now we're we're pretty much set. Uh, you know, we've reviewed every every player in our program. You know, our assistant coaches have spent the last two days uh, meeting with every player in our program individually, uh, setting up their summer, their goals, and and the main question we've asked them is. How are you making Tennessee better with your presence being here? You know, how are you making your, your input on our program? And uh, so we've done that the last two days, and then they, they hit the ground running tomorrow in spring recruiting. And uh, But you know what? We think we got the players in the right spots. Now they just need to continue to develop. I'm not sure I've heard you address this. I'm curious, what's the toughest position to evaluate and project from the high school level to the college level, in your opinion? Boy, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I think different positions challenge you. You know, DB is, is extremely hard because of the camera angles at times. Um, receiver is an extremely difficult uh, position, and it's amazing is when Jeff Fisher 
the head coach of the Rams was in here last week uh, working some of our players out. We were talking about the evaluation process, and, you know, he shared with me, he thought the receiver position is extremely hard to, uh, you know, to uh, evaluate. I would say kickers. Uh, kickers, punters are extremely challenging. Receivers, DBs. And I think just the overall in general, that's why we like to be able to see the individual compete in other sports, see their competitive instincts, um, see what type of competitive spirit that they have, but to also see them live and look at their their foot quickness and so many, you know, intangibles that, that really, really go into it. But, you know, the other thing that we're trying to gauge, I think that has lost the evaluation process, is instincts. You know, a lot of the National Football League teams – that's what they're relying on is, is uh, you know, there's kind of a formula. And uh, a lot of that uh, is speed, obviously, and we need speed in this conference, competitiveness, and also instincts. And I think instincts are extremely hard to gauge on film uh, by every position. But really that's one of the requisites, prerequisites you look like when, when you look for when you're trying to evaluate a linebacker. Coach, you mentioned the kickers. I, I had an opportunity to announce a lot of George Bullock's games here in Knoxville and saw the terrific leg that he had obviously suffered the the leg injury last year kind of bring us up to date on on what how you, what you've seen in his development George Bullock and where he fits sort of in your kicking competition well I think George kind of uh you know continues to be work in progress you know the big thing that that we wanted to see was consistently consistency throughout all of spring football and uh you know from uh, you know about 35 yards, 33 yards in, our, our kickers have to be automatic. And then you know when you get outside that range, you're playing a percentage game. Um, you know, so you, if right now Mike Pilardi's had the best spring, both as a punter and a place kicker. And George will continue to develop. But if the season were to start uh, tomorrow, uh, Mike would be our punter and our kicker. And uh, again, you know, so much progress can be made throughout training camp. And we're going to need him to step up and bring some competition uh, each and every day in the training camp. And then we'll, we'll reassess just like we reassess each and every day in practice. I guess Butch Jones, Tennessee's coach. Butch, if you don't find the playmakers that you would like at receiver and at running back, would you be forced this fall to look at playing a more mobile quarterback to give you a weapon at that position? Well, you know what? Everything is trying to find and create ways uh, for your playmakers, and I, you know, I've always said it as a coach's job is to be able to create one-on-one matchups, and then it's it's the player's job to go win those one-on-one matchups, and we have to do a good job as coaches of putting in those opportunities and situations to be able to win, and you know, the fundamentals and the fine details. But you know, we may have to manufacture different things. You know, trying to, you know, I don't so much, you know, I, to say that we're going to run the quarterback a lot in our offense. I don't think we have that type of personnel to do that. But we, what we may have to do is formation teams, you know, try to create short edges or, or long edges and give us, you know, make them uh, a gap short. You know, I think we have to play with a, with a great tempo, you know, to try to take away team defense. I think that's one of the things that a tempo offense does is it takes away team defense, you know, and I think we have to do a good job of mixing it up from the run game to play action to misdirection, you know, picking our, our spots and being a team that, that wears you out. And uh, But like we saw in the spring game, we're going to have to be able to win on the perimeter or we're going to face eight and nine men boxes. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's extremely challenging to run the football in those circumstances. But I do feel confident that we have the offense, we have the system to generate some uh, some one-on-one matchups. And I do think that we do have some individuals that can be playmakers for us. They just have to do it on a consistent basis. I don't know. Uh, this may be a silly question, but in regard to the up-tempo offense, I've noticed that your players, after a play, the ball carrier, receiver, whatever, quarterback, they hand the ball to the official. Is that an effort to help speed it up so the officials can get the ball and play quicker? Well, first of all, thank you for noticing that because that's <laughs> something that we take great pride in. And I'll say this first and foremost, everything that we do with a football is a mentality. You know, that ball holds all of our dreams, goals, and aspirations. So why would we ever want that ball laying on the ground? So we call that the ball rule. And when you watch us practice, all of our uh, managers are in uh, referee jerseys, officials' jerseys, to get them in the habits of handing the ball to the official. There's an art to it. 
And, uh, you know, we have to do a much better job in training camp of our players understanding which official to hand the ball to. And then it's a spot-the-ball mentality. It, it does. It, it, it accelerates the game. It speeds it up so you're not relying on, you know, a ball boy to hand the official the ball or the ball's not on the ground and they have to bend over and pick it up. So in today's world of football with the 40-second clock, the faster that we can hand the ball to the official. Um, so it's a procedural thing, but it's also a mentality thing as well. One thing that I'm curious to get your take on is the SEC has debated whether or not to expand from eight to nine conference games. And one thought is the SEC might do it because when they launch this new SEC network, they want to improve the inventory. What's your position on that? Would you rather play eight conference games or nine? You know what, Jimmy, I really haven't thought much about it. You know, I've been so focused on this football team. But, uh, you know, we have some obviously some great uh, football programs in this conference. And I think the nine games, uh, they do make sense, you know, especially obviously with the power of television. So I do think that that makes sense. And then obviously your three non-conference games are going to be absolutely critical as we move forward. But I do think that nine conference games does make a lot of sense. Coach, talk about some of the former players at Cincinnati and also Central Michigan. We've talked to you about Eric Fisher, and he's certainly in the mix to be a, a top three, top five pick. And and when those, what fans might not realize, is when your players at Cincinnati and Central Michigan get drafted high and have success in the NFL, that's only going to help you. That's only going to help Tennessee in recruiting and in the future. Talk about Travis Kelsey and then some of the other guys from Cincinnati that fans can look for when in the upcoming NFL draft. Great. Well, you know, it's uh, it's been a great couple of weeks for me. And uh, last night I was on the phone all night with head coaches and general managers across the National Football League. And, you know, uh, I had an opportunity to speak with Eric Fisher and Eric Fisher uh, it's going to be one of the top players selected in this year's NFL draft. He's a left tackle out of Central Michigan, and we recruited him, and he actually played for us as a true freshman. He helped us win a championship, and just so proud of him. He, you know, Again, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to continue to say it, is we do not get caught up in stars, three, four, five-star athletes. If you look in the National Football League, the average star of an NFL player is three. And so we don't really get caught up into that because – you know, we know what we need. Eric Fisher is a great illustration. I want to say he was a two star. He was a six foot five, 240 pound offensive lineman that could run. Uh, he had the frame to put the size on, and he's going to be playing football for a long period of time. You look at Joe Staley, uh, who was a Pro Bowl left tackle for the San Francisco 49ers. He was with us at Central Michigan. He was a tight end. He was six five, six six, two 220 pounds out of high school. Now he's about 330. And uh, he's one of the best tackles on the National Football League. Travis Kelsey, by all accounts, is the number one projected tight end in this year's draft. Uh, probably has changed more than any individual, any individual I've ever had the opportunity to coach. And he can do it all. Uh, you know, you look at Antonio Brown, who was second year in the league, was voted team MVP by his peers. Uh, he played for us at Central Michigan. You look at Nick Ballore two-star athlete uh, who's now starting Mike Backer for the New York Jets, led all the uh, special team performers and tackles. So I think you go on and on. I think, you know, our reputation of developing players uh, speaks for itself. Our staff has done a great job, but you're exactly right. That helps us. We have, uh, you know, we have evidence of developing our players, and I'm excited for them this weekend. Coach, I'm amazed at your energy and watching practice. And UT Sports did a great feature on you and, and putting the meter on you and see how many steps you took and how many miles you walk around and run around in, in practice. Do you, when you're outside of the facility, do you have a workout routine to unwind? Or what's what's your, your fitness outside of the facility and outside of work, if at all? Boy, you're getting me in trouble right now. <laughs> uh, you know what? I have not had any opportunity to work out. And uh, I hit the ground running, and I've been really bad. So part of that energy at practice is so I can eat more during the day. I'm trying to burn those calories. But, uh, you know, I've been living this job 24-7. I get in the office about 6 a.m. in the morning, and uh, I get home about 9, 10 o'clock at night, and it's been nonstop. I will tell you this, for the first time since I've been here, and the first time this year, and I know school is almost out, I drove my middle-aged son to school today and uh, dropped them off. And I tell you what, just those 
20 minutes of him and I riding in the car today was priceless and I uh, enjoyed it. But, uh, you know, all my focus and concentration right now is getting Tennessee football back. A couple other questions, Coach. I, I do wonder, and this is uh, there are differing opinions in the SEC on this. Some SEC schools offer multi-year scholarships. Some do not. Do you think that the uh, college athletes should get multi-year scholarships, or do you think it should be renewed annually? Well, I think the big thing is it's done by a case-by-case basis. And, uh, you know, I, I tell you what, there is some security for a young man knowing um, that, you know, his college is going to be guaranteed. Um, but also I think we live, um, you know, in, in a society where you're gauged on production and everything is about production. And, you know, what we always tell our our, our, uh, our players this is, you know, the only way really a scholarship will ever be taken from you is if you don't live right uh, off the field and uh, you don't, uh, you know, you don't do what you need to do academically or, you know, you do something that, that's uh, going to get yourself in trouble. And, you know, that's pretty much been a standard line for us, and we've lived by that. So I think it's a case-by-case uh, instance with each individual. Is there any update on the status of Marlon Lane? Well, you know, I've said it, and I'll continue to say it, as we hold our players, obviously, to a very high standard of accountability, not only on the field, but more importantly, off the field. And, uh, you know, Marlon continues to be, to be suspended from all team activities, and, uh, you know, he has some criteria that he has to meet for reinstatement. Uh, that's ongoing. And when he proves to us and, and he meets that criteria, then we'll talk about reinstatement at that point in time. Coach Jones, the Miami Heat going to win the NBA championship? Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously I believe they have game two tonight with the Milwaukee Bucks. So, mm-hmm. see, I do have a little bit of time to follow up with my good friend Eric Spolster. But you know what? Uh, it's been great. You know, him and I had a long talk Sunday, Sunday evening. And uh, so I'm excited for them as they venture on this journey. And uh, you know what? Uh, you know it's going to be a, a great challenge for them because every game they're supposed to win. And uh, you know, managing those personalities and trying to get them. And they're, uh, you know, the the, the the number is 16 wins to win a world championship. So I'm excited for them. They got 15 more to go. But how did that friendship develop with Eric Spolstra? Well, it started uh, ironically last year and. Uh, we, you know, we have the same agent. We met. I went to a game uh, late in March, and uh, we talked after the game, and, and it was kind of we hit it off. We share the same philosophies and motivation and all trying to go uh, get better, and we actually went to dinner that night, and uh, we spent about two and a half hours of, of really talking motivation and uh, talking about their title run last year, and uh, they adopted our theme, Sign Your Name. You know, sign your name. Your last name is all you have, and that's your personal brand. And uh, you know, we just we developed a very strong relationship. But I was at a number of playoff games last year. I was there uh, in the locker room after they beat OKC uh, in Game Five to clinch it. And uh, he's a big football fan. You'll see him a lot in Knoxville uh, during training camp and during the season. And uh, so, again, you can always take bits and pieces from coaches, and there's a lot of similarities between coaching basketball and coaching football. So he's turned into a very dear friend of mine. Fantastic. Hey, Butch, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Great to hear from you, and we look forward to you joining us again sometime in the future. As always, thanks again. You guys have a great evening, and go Vols. Thank you, Butch. Thanks, Coach. Butch Jones, Tennessee's head football coach.